Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. We're going to start off with a little bit of a word association. Um, You know how this works, right? I give you a word, you shout back the first word that comes to mind, and we're just going to do it uh, orally. Uh, you, you know, uh, you feel free to shout it out, and um, and 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 uh, and don't think that if you do that, it'll it'll destroy all the science behind what I'm doing. So so just uh, just give me your first word that comes to mind. So let's give it a shot. All right, first of all, um, peanut butter. Okay, yeah. good. Um, uh, up. Yeah. Wet. Dry. Eggs. <laughs> See, it's not primarily a vegetarian crowd, I can tell you that. <laughs> Bacon, yeah. Wouldn't you feel funny if you cauliflower? But uh, yeah, uh, okay, how about, um, how about uh, wet, uh, bald? <laughs> Thought you were going to say beautiful. Uh, yeah, uh, the first word that comes to mind um, the second is misfortune, but, but uh, okay, uh, how about this, uh, how about marriage? Be careful. <laughs> Be careful if you say bacon again. Uh, okay, how about this, how about faith? Uh-huh, uh-huh. very good, very good. Those of you who use church answers, some of you just go, Jesus. But uh, yeah, that's good. How about, uh, how about uh, discipleship? Okay, somebody again, Jesus, that's kind of the church answer. I mean, you, you, you always know when you're in church and you don't know the answer, just go, God? But uh, yeah, you could say God, yeah, okay, yeah. But yeah, our, uh, yeah you know what's interesting is that, that, that I bet had I just wandered up and down the rows here and I actually did the word association with each of you individually. I couldn't hear, I heard some answers, but if I just actually done it individually with you, I will wager that most of the people in this room, when we hear the words faith or words like discipleship, one of the first words that does not come to mind is the word combat, warfare, fight. And yet, and yet, that is precisely the imagery that the Apostle Paul uses in the passage of scripture that we're going to look at this week and next week in Ephesians chapter 6. Now, that is precisely the imagery he uses to talk about the life of a disciple. That in some sense, we are involved in warfare. We're engaged in combat. Um, If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible and you'd like to have one, all you have to do is raise your hand. We have some folks who would love to see that you get one right down here. Yeah, just keep that hand up. We'll make sure that you you get one. Ephesians chapter 6. Um, this is uh, n- near the end of the book, if, uh, if you're not kind of familiar with the layout of the thing. This is a letter that Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul wrote to a church at a place called Ephesus. Um, it's really divided into two parts. Part one, chapters one, two, and three, is where Paul really talks to the believers about their, their calling, that, that who we are in Christ. He, he says that we've been blessed in Christ with every spiritual gift. Then he sort of sort of turns the page, and in chapters 4, 5, and 6, the latter part of the letter, he talks about no longer the calling, but the conduct. Because of who we're called to be, this is how we're called to live. And that's why in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So when he opens this, this sixth chapter, he's really beginning to kind of close out this letter to these guys, and, and he wants to kind of give them a summary charge, a, a, a word of, of challenge uh, as he finishes out the letter. And it's precisely those words that we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Um, so let me, uh, let's see, it's, is it going to be on the screen? Let's put it up on the screen. We can read it out loud together. Can we do that? Yeah, fantastic. Okay, let's read together. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, 
against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Stand with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. When, when I was a little boy, um, for, for nine successive summers, my mom took me and my brother uh, to Tallahassee, Florida every summer for nine weeks. She did this because um, little by little, she was earning her master's degree in early childhood education. Um, this was an amazing undertaking now as I think back about this woman trying to do this with two kids. Uh, one of them ill-behaved, my brother, and, and, uh, and, and how difficult this must be because every day she had to read, she had to study, and, uh, and, and you know, uh, my dad had to stay back and work, and, and I just thought, well, now when I think about it, it's such a challenge. Every day she had to figure out how in the world do I keep these guys occupied while I read so that I can actually study. And if you have uh, young boys in your house, you can imagine what this is like. Uh, you know, we were constantly wrestling and fighting. So she came up with a great idea. Uh, she, every afternoon, she'd take us to this lake. Uh, it's a spring-fed lake just out of Tallahassee, a place called Lake Bradford. And uh, if you've ever, in fact, seen any of the old black-and-white Tarzan movies... They were actually filmed at Lake Bradford. It's just, it's just exotic looking, a crystal clear water lake, um, cypress trees kind of hanging out over the shoreline, Spanish moss. Uh, it, it, it sort of looked like you thought the, the jungle should look. And, uh, and in fact, you could literally, you could literally see um, uh, on, on a side of the lake, you could actually see big pins where they used to, in the day, actually leave the elephants when they were, when they were filming Tarzan films there. Um, and, uh, and, and um, in fact, there were alligators on the far side. Of the, in fact, a lot of times my mom would say, you boys race across. But, uh, but, uh, but they were, they were uh, you know, my mom had a weird sense of humor. But, but uh, and, and, and you're laughing, but my brother misses that, that leg. But, but, uh, but, but. You know, we would, you know, but if you know much about boys, like that, that was kind of awesome. That was amazing for about three days. Then like, oh my gosh, come on, you know, mom, we want to do something else. This is boring. And so then she came up with um, like an upgrade. What she did was she, and this actually worked. This was beautiful. She bought me and my brother. Uh, most guys in here, you probably had one of these. She bought us these rubber knives. You know, the kind with the red handle and the silver painted blade. And we would go out on the dock. They had kind of this dock there jutted out in the lake. And we would just <clears throat> basically, hours on end, take turns killing each other with these knives. Uh, like, like, you know, he would kill me. He'd, you know, we'd wrestle and he'd stab me. And I'd go, ah, 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 ah. You know, and then I'd fall into the lake. And then, I'd, okay, you know, my turn, I'd kill him. And, and then he'd kill me and I'd kill him. And it was the way uh, our mom taught us to, to love each other. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, you're laughing, but we were very good with rubber knives. And, and I still say, in fact, if we'd been, ever been attacked by somebody with a rubber gun, we could have defended ourselves. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what made that fun is that those were not real knives. That was play fight. That was play fight. The, if the blades had been real, it probably would have been a little less entertaining what Paul wants us to understand in Ephesians chapter 6 is that you and I as believers are not engaged in some kind of play fight. This is the real thing. That we are in fact embroiled in combat. In fact, in verse 11, four times Paul uses the word against, 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 against. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against, 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 against. He wants us to understand this is a real battle. This is not play fight. The, the, the name here that's used for our opponent in Greek is diabolos. Diabolos, it's the word we translate into devil. Literally, it means accuser. It means accuser, a scandalizer, false accuser. Uh, in other places in scripture, our, our opponent is known by the name satanus. 
Satanus, which we uh, anglicize into the word Satan, which literally means opponent or adversary. We are talking here about a real and uh, fearsome enemy. And yet what's interesting is this. If you read through this passage in Ephesians chapter 6, you begin to realize that there's no place in the passage where we're actually warned about our enemy's powers. We're never, ever warned about Satan's powers. We're warned only about his strategies, his schemes, his wiles. In in fact, it's interesting. If you go back to Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning of the Bible, the very beginning of human history, when the enemy began his mischief, his cosmic mischief, uh, if you go back, verse 1 of chapter 3 in Genesis We hear the serpent, we hear Satan described this way. He was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made. In fact, Jesus actually refers to him uh, on one occasion as shrewd. That that it's the wiles we're warned of, not the power. In in Luke chapter 4, when when Jesus is out in the wilderness, Satan tempts him by literally quoting scripture, trying to kind of twist and distort because he's a schemer, he's he's a deceiver. Paul actually says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, that, that he even disguises himself sometimes as an angel of light. Jesus referred to Satan in chapter 8 of the Gospel of John, verse 44, as, as the father of lies. So we're talking here about a, a real enemy, uh, but an enemy uh, for whom the real threat is not his power, but his, his schemes, his, his strategies, the way he literally gets inside our head. Um, when, I was a, when I was a little boy, about six, seven, eight years old, right around there, it was around second, third grade, we lived in this development, and there was a, uh, and there was a, um, a, a patch of woods in our development, and you could cut through that patch of woods, and you could um, save about five minutes off of the trip to the bus stop. The problem was, there, there was a guy that, this, that, that area's all developed and filled in now, but at the time there was a guy that lived up there in his old rundown shack. And, um, and, and he, 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 you know how kids' minds were. We, we just thought this guy was like weird. We, everybody referred to him as Crazy Lucas. And, and, uh, and he, was, he was definitely odd and he definitely wasn't friendly. And, uh, and, and there was a lot to kind of make him come across as scary. But the scariest part about Crazy Lucas was he had a dog, a pit bull, that was parked in his front yard. And a lot of the mythology around Lucas focused on the dog, which kids referred to as the devil dog. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, just, just the idea of a pit bull, and of course, if you got near, you know, you'd, you could get the, the growls, and, and then, of course, uh, everybody would sort of enjoy being scared. And, and, and in fact, one of the tricks was that, uh, that, that if you were having a sleepover, you'd go up there and, and, and you know, dare somebody to poke the devil dog. Uh, a couple of times, me and my buddies went up there and actually threw um, stuffed animals at it, uh, just to, you know, just to watch it, uh, you know, dismember them. And, uh, and I think a lot of that comes out of the entertainment me and my brother did on, on afternoons in the summer with knives. But but basically, it, it was a uh, this whole kind of deal. Well, well, uh, and so what happened was everybody was afraid of the dog, except for one kid. That kid was kind of cocky. He said, nobody, you don't have to, you know, that, that thousand, you know dogs, they're not going to bother. You know, and, and anyway, that kid got bitten by the dog. And, and, that, uh, and that required Lucas to put the dog on a chain. But there were some people who were still so freaked out, especially some of the girls, excuse me, but they were, some of the girls were so freaked out, they would not take that shortcut. They'd literally veer around and take the long way. And, and in a sense, this is kind of the story that Paul is telling us about Satan. In other words, he's saying essentially that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are some people who do not properly respect the bite of the dog, and they can be injured. But there are others who do not respect the power of the chain that restrains the dog. That when we think about our enemy, we need, first of all, to recognize he is real. 
And that there is a potency, there is a sense that his schemes can actually woo us and mislead us in destructive ways. We need not, we dare not underestimate that. On the other hand, there are also people, maybe some of us in this room, who are so intimidated by Satan, we see him behind every bad event, we see him behind every rock and tree, we're constantly spooked and afraid and literally going out of our way because we're intimidated by this enemy who has been chained by Jesus. Paul, in the very first chapter of this letter, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21, says that, in fact, Jesus is above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. Our enemy, Satan, is a defeated foe. We don't need to go out of our We don't need to be intimidated, but neither should we take him anything other than seriously. C.S. Lewis put it like this. He said, he said there are two equal and opposite mistakes our race can make and fall into about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. One is to disbelieve in their existence. And there may be some of us here. That, that's kind of you. you. You don't really take seriously the forces of darkness. You, when you think of the devil, you know, you kind of think of, you know, this guy in a, in a costume sitting on the goalpost at the end of the end zone, you know, and it's like, ah, rascal, you know, and, and, and that's, kind of, that's kind of Satan. Others of us make the second mistake. C.S. Lewis said, one is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and take an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. What we need to understand about our enemy, about our opponent, is simply this. First of all, he's real. Secondly, that he is a defeated foe. And third, that in Jesus Christ, in our Lord, in the strength of his might, we can have victory over Satan. That's why Paul, in the very first verse of this section of his letter, verse 10, chapter 6, he says, finally then, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And and that's why he encourages us in the strength of the might of Christ to put on the full armor of God. It's that armor of God on which we want to focus this week and next. Now, if you've been in church more than about 20 minutes, you have probably already heard a bunch of sermons on the armor of God. I get it. Uh, I realize that some of you go, oh, I've never heard of that before. Uh, My prayer is that God will help us to see this in a fresh and new way. This is always a timely warning, the, the, the wiles of the enemy, and it's also a timely word of encouragement to recognize that in Christ, we have our sufficiency. So what we're gonna do is today, we're gonna look at two of those pieces of armor, what might be described actually as the under armor. And then next week, we're gonna look at the other four pieces of armor, which would really be kind of uh, considered the outer armor that we have in Christ. Um, my goal, one of my goals in these two Sundays is that if you don't remember anything else, that you at least learn the pieces of armor. And so I want you to repeat after me. First of all, belt, breastplate, boot, bonnet. I know there's not a bonnet, but helmet does not begin with B. Uh, and uh, so, so belt, breastplate, boot, bonnet. Okay, that's okay. You can just say bonnet. Okay, and then sword, sword. Shield. shield. And then we're going to celebrate the fact that we have victory in Christ. We're going to say, you've already won it. You've already won. So it's going to be like this, belt, breastplate, boot, bonnet, sword, shield. You've already won it. All right, so let's try that. Belt, breastplate, boot, bonnet, sword, shield. You've already won. Yeah, yeah, that's awful. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no. Uh, that was, uh, that's one of those things where the crowd went mild. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, looking for, I'm looking for a little uh, attitude here, you know. Give me, uh, you know, give me uh, Braveheart, face blue, freedom. Uh, you know, what I go, well, breath like moon, moon. You know, uh, you know. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, if, if you do this right, it's going to even almost have a rap feel to it. I know, I know a lot of you, when you saw me walk up this morning, some of you never seen me before, you go, I bet the dude raps. And um, I do. I mean, no, seriously, you should see me at Christmas. Just lots of rapping. But, but this is going to be, no. I know I love rap. Scoop Doggy Poo, he rocks. But um, <clears throat> this, is, um, 
This is going to have, I suppose, like the belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield. You already want it. So let me hear it. Here we go. The belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield. You already want. All right, one more time. You're almost there. If that was a six on a scale of one to 10, give me at least an eight. Let's do it. The belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield. You already want. Yeah, and, and what's going to happen is tomorrow you're going to get to work and somebody's going to go, well, you know, our school or they go, well, 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 do you remember the sermon? You go, yeah, the belt, the breastplate, the boot, the bonnet, the sword, the shield. You already want it. And they're going to go, you're on drugs. But uh, <laughs> those six pieces of armor, those six pieces of armor are the armor in which we clothe ourselves in our sufficiency in Christ. You know that as Paul wrote these words, he was actually sitting in a Roman jail cell. Pretty much 24-7, he was either connected to, chained to one of those Roman guards or chained very closely in their presence. So he was able to see head to toe the armament of the typical Roman foot soldier. And you see that armament played out in this chapter in Ephesians chapter 6. There are a couple of pieces of armor that he does not mention. But essentially, he, he sort of walks us through their armament in a sense, almost as if they would themselves put it on. And that's why this week we want to start with the under armor or inside out. So the first of those pieces of armor, Paul says, therefore, therefore, put on the whole armor of God. And then he begins with the first two pieces of armor, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. Let's look at the first one, the belt of truth, the belt of truth. For a Roman soldier, the very first piece of armor that you put on was, in fact, not something on the outside, but something on the inside. You put on a belt of truth. Now, we refer to it as the belt of truth, but actually in the Greek and in, in, in practice, what they actually did, it, this belt was really more of an undergarment. It was really more of a girdle. Although I think you can appreciate why legionnaires preferred to think of it as a belt. But, but they, they basically would put this thing on underneath everything else because that would actually be what all the other pieces of armor were attached to. Uh, if you think about it like this, you, let's say you're putting on your breastplate. And these breastplates are not connected up here. They're connected here at the chest and here. That way uh, you, could, you could adjust the breastplate for lots of different body sizes. So if you had your breastplate and it was not properly attached here, then, then you could, in fact, have this, because it was, it was actually open there, you could actually have your breastplate sinking down. You know, you, you, you imagine, uh, you know, you're a foot soldier, and you're trying to fight, and all of a sudden you realize your breastplate is sinking, you know? And, 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 and so now, you're, you're, you know, you're kind of fighting like this. Next thing you know, it's like, you know, this basically is no longer a breastplate. It's a shin guard. I mean, you, you, you have to have the thing buckled tightly to your belt. Belt is first. It was absolutely first. Same thing. I mean, think about this. With your sword, when you would be a Roman legionnaire, you had sort of loose ends of your tunic. You would tuck that inside those, inside that belt. Otherwise, uh, you know, you're charging into battle and you, you fall over, you trip uh, on your tunic. Also your sword. If you don't have that belt of truth buckled tightly, to what are you going to attach your sword? You can't just you know, stick it in your thigh until you need. You, you, you have to have that thing buckled. So the belt of truth was absolutely critical. The belt for the Roman soldier was the first piece of armament and it had to be buckled very, very securely. Paul says that for you and for me, our belt, what we put on, first of all, is what he describes as the belt of truth. Now, what does he mean by this, this belt of truth? It means two things. First of all, when he says the belt of truth, he means that you and I need to know the truth. We need to know the truth. Now, we live in a culture today that says there is no such thing as truth. We live in a culture that pretty much sort of says, well, uh, it, you know, it, it depends on interpretation. Everything is whatever you say it is. And there's no such thing as truth or falsehood. My, my wife and I were doing our, she wanted to redo our kitchen several years ago. And, and that meant, putting up some wallpaper. And, and I am not good around the house. Like, like my idea of handiwork is, is, is handing someone to do the work. And, and I'm just not good at this. I didn't have that gene. And, uh, but I thought, how hard can it be to paste paper to a wall? And, and so I go, 
Um, yeah, let's do it. We go over to Home Depot, we buy the paper, get the Time Life wallpaper guide. I bring this thing home and I am ready. Um, and uh, right away in the Time Life wallpaper guide, you read that step one in the process is to use something called a plumb line, a plumb line, which, you know, I didn't know what it was. And I see you there uh, sitting smugly uh, as if, you, oh, come on. You know, everybody knows that. I didn't know. But a, but a, but a plumb line, for those of you don't know, is when you take a piece of string and you attach it uh, at the top of the wall and then you weight it at the bottom so it hangs straight down. Then what you do is you, you, you chalk that string, pull it tight, pop it up against the wall, and it gives you a true up and down line. That's important because that first panel of wallpaper is going gonna, is gonna to have an impact on every other panel uh, in the room. And so I understood the concept, I understood the principle, but I couldn't find any string. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, and we tried, you know, we, we, like I tried an electric cord and, um, yeah, you know, I don't need a lot of ridicule, you know. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it's just kind of painful some of this stuff. And uh, and and so anyway, I uh, and so, but you know, we. So I finally just said to her, I said, "Look, uh, this is not the East Room of the White House." I said, "Let's just cite it." You know, please don't get ahead of me. I, I said, uh, "I said let's just cite." And so she goes, oh, "Okay." And so so she goes over the ladder, and you know. I say, because you can move it, you know, when it's wet. You can move the paper. I said, Mother, go back. No, just a little bit. Too, oh, no, it's too much. Go back a little bit. First, first panel, she goes, you take a look. So I go over, move it. She looks. She goes, yeah, back just a little. The first panel looked awesome. In fact, I still say, if we had stopped with that one panel, <laughs> probably would have been fine. She wanted to go on around the room. So, so we do. And, uh, and actually, it's looking pretty good. In fact, it's looking really good. Until we get to the second corner, that's when she started to annoy me because she started to ask questions like this, Duffy, if it's straight up and down, why does it overlap the corner like that on two walls? <laughs> I had to explain to her, <laughs> this is an older house and homes routinely sink a couple of inches in one corner. So, so that's why God made razor blades. And, and so I fixed that. <clears throat> Keep on coming, making good time. By the time we get back to the fourth wall, though, it's clear something has gone wrong. We're, we're, we're sort of buoying one another's spirits by going, no, I like it. It, it, it has movement. Uh, <clears throat> people walk into our kitchen now and they go, I like what you've done to this room. Do you have anything for motion sickness? I mean, basically what we did with that project is we began without a plumb line. We live in a culture that has no plumb line. It's, it's, it's reminiscent of the book of Judges where we read every, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. The Apostle Paul says, no, no, no. You, everything's going to be wobbling and waffling all over the place if that's the way you bear your armor. You start with the belt of truth. You know the truth. And, and you go, well, what you, well, we know the truth about God, that he's good, that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. We know the truth about ourselves, that we are people who, who have been cosmically, cosmically scarred by, by sin, by disobedience to God. We know the truth about who Jesus is, that he's God in the flesh. And there may be some of you here today that you're just kind of visiting Faith Bridge, uh, you know, and, and, and you're just checking stuff out and just kind of see what, Part of what it means to be a Christian is to embrace these truths by faith. That's what it means. We know the truth. We, we embrace this truth by faith. That's part of what it means. You start there, you buckle on the truth. You know the truth. But it also means this, that, that, that in fact, when Paul talks about a belt of truth, it's not just knowing the truth, it's being true to what we know. It's being true to what we know. In other words, it's, it's integrity. 
It, it, it truly is living our lives for Jesus from the inside out. It, it's not just kind of working on a whole bunch of kind of uh, nice behaviors on the outside, Sunday morning kind of stuff, religious language, bless you, hi, brother Bob. Uh, you know, it, it, it's basically from the inside out, living out the truth that we know. I, I remember back in the 70s, there was a... Uh, there was a, you're going, Duffy, you, you were alive in the 70s? Yeah. But um, <laughs> there was a commercial by Hanes Underwear. And some of you may remember this. It, the, and the, the tagline, the campaign was, Hanes makes you feel good all under. Hanes makes you feel good all under. And, and, and one of the main commercials that I can recall from that campaign was this guy gets on a crowded elevator. And he's telling everybody about how nicely his underwear fits and, and how, how comfortable it makes him. And, uh, and there's one old lady who's really smiling and nodding. Everybody else is a little bit uncomfortable uh, with the conversation. I don't know if you've tried that uh, on an elevator. I can tell you my experience is that most people, frankly, are not that interested. Uh, <clears throat> And, and, and how I feel about my underwear. But, but, but basically, the idea was, this guy's going, it all starts on the inside. A lot of us, this is our experience as Christians, we are uncomfortable with our faith primarily because, not because we don't know the truth, but because we're not being true to what we know. And part of our armament against an enemy whose main stratagem is deceit and lies is to know truth and be true to what we know. That's the first piece of armor. It all starts there. Everything is buckled to that, the belt of truth. Second piece of armor that Paul talks about is the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is one of those words um, that, I don't know about you, but to me, there's like a lot of church words that you don't use anywhere else in your life, like, like in my high school. You could go weeks without using the word propitiation. And, uh, and, 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 and you just don't use this terminology very often. And, and, and then when you hear it, you're not really sure, well, what does it mean? And so I think it's kind of underappreciated. Uh, it's like I remember in church, you know, as a kid, I'd hear the preacher say, we need to be consecrated. You know, I'm going, well, I don't want to be constipated. And, 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 and I look around the sanctuary, I go, no, they do look constipated. And, and, uh, and, but, but righteousness is, I think, one of those words. And, and maybe you're here to go, righteousness. I mean, it's not one of those qualities we aspire to. It's not one of those, it's not one of, for most of us, it's not on our bucket list. I want to really be considered righteous. I think in part that's because we don't understand the power of this word. It's a huge word. Let me just explain it in, in, in a very, very simple way. First of all, righteousness is faith and love fleshed out. It's faith and love fleshed out. Well, well, what do you mean by that? Righteousness means two things, very simple. Righteousness, first of all, means right usefulness. Righteousness is right usefulness. This microphone right here is a righteous microphone because it was designed by its creator to amplify the human voice, Luke, right? It was, it was designed to amplify the human voice. That was the designer's intent. This morning, that's precisely the way it's being used. And to that extent, it glorifies its designer. It glorifies its creator. That's righteousness. It's right usefulness. You, you and I, for example, we have gifts that God's given us. Maybe, you're, you, maybe you, you have an ability to do accounting. Maybe you have an ability to play, to throw football. Maybe you have an ability to, to show hospitality. Maybe you have an ability just to organize things that you are really competent at, at, at detail work. Maybe your ability is, is, is music. Righteousness is rightly using those gifts so that they bring glory, not to you, but to your creator. That's righteousness, right usefulness. All of us here this morning have gifts like sight. Righteousness is when I rightly use my gift of sight. If I use that gift, 
to, to, to maybe look at, 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 at things that, that I shouldn't look at, pornography or something like that, then, then that, that's going to that's gonna deny glory to my creator. It's going to suggest that my creator somehow has, has messed up the plan. So righteousness is right usefulness of the gift of sight. The way I use my tongue, the way I speak, the way I talk to other people, whether I use gossip or whether I slander or, or, or whether I use deceit, righteousness is right usefulness of my tongue. Righteousness is fleshing out faith and love by rightly using the gifts that God has given us. That's righteousness. But righteousness is something else as well. It's also right relatedness. It's right relatedness. If, um, if this morning we turned off all the lights in the auditorium, every light in the auditorium except for one, and that one light was a lamp that was our light that was directly above me. And it was just directly over my head. There would be immediately two observations that we would all make. Number one is an obnoxious glare. Number two, there, it's not funny. Number two, there would be, if you were close enough, some of you down here, you might be able to see it. If you were close enough, you would notice that there's actually no shadow where I'm standing. There's no shadow where I'm standing. If, however, I were to take a step this direction, there would what? There'd be a shadow. And the further I go from that position, there would be an increasing shadow, right? The shadow would get larger. Now, think about it like this. A shadow is nothing but darkness with a shape. Darkness with a shape. Righteousness is essentially a word that we use to describe what it means to live in a right relationship with God's son. And that when we live in a right relationship with God's son, we walk in the light, not in the darkness. One of the problems is that people, when they think about righteousness, they think of this kind of nitty, picky, uh, legalistic righteousness, you know, you, you eat bird seed and lettuce leaf and, you know, and, and that you have all these rules. Righteousness is not about watching my feet to make sure there's no darkness. That's legalism. Righteousness is about keeping my eyes on the sun, working on my relationship with him, bathing, basking in my relationship with him. As, as, as the scripture puts it, if you walk in the light as he was in the light, there won't be darkness. So righteousness, righteousness is in a sense a, a gift of a relationship lived properly with God. That's righteousness. And righteousness protects our heart. The Roman soldier, when he put on that breastplate, he understood there are really two vital organs that must be protected in battle. One is the head. We'll talk about that next week. The other is the heart. The other is the heart. And what protects our heart as believers is the breastplate of righteousness. When the enemy assails us, we have this to protect us, right usefulness, right usefulness of our gifts, righteousness, and right relatedness, being in a right relationship with God. Not, not walking around scared to death that, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm not going to do this. Don't do that. Thou shalt not do this. It's not about watching for shadows. It's about remaining in the light, focused on him. Those two pieces of armor begin everything else. That's where it starts. It's the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. I don't know the whole story, but I know enough of it that I kind of understand the contour, the outline of how it played out. Uh, as I understand it, it started out with a want ad that was placed in the LA Times. And the want ad simply said, for sale, $200. Satan, pet South American boa constrictor. Safe. Fun, and then I love this line, loves children of all ages, and uh, educational, and then it gave a phone number and a man's name, Al Sanders. Nobody paid too much attention to it. If you ever look through the LA Times, there are all kinds of personals and want ads in that paper every day. This was just kind of another day at the office for the LA Times. In fact, it wasn't until nine years later that an enterprising reporter connected that want ad for sale $200, Satan, pet South American bull constrictor, 
with an ad with a, with a story in that morning's newspaper that said, family's pet snake squeezes nine-month-old infant to death. In researching the story, um, this reporter discovered that the father in this household had been on a business trip out on the West Coast. And while he was out there, he just happened to see this want ad. And he thought to himself, well, that's kind of cool. That's kind of fun, kind of, you know, kind of edgy. And, 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 and uh, w- wouldn't this be something w- w- how the neighbors would think it's cool? And so he actually bought the snake, got it back home. And, uh, and it was, in fact, it was, in fact, a, a real novelty. I mean, people in the neighborhood used to come over with their kids, the, 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 the family. Everybody thought this was great. Uh, just, you know, how edgy, how creative, kind of interesting educational sure it was all those things for nine years until the morning they woke up and they discovered that this snake had squeezed the life out of their nine month little boy men and women one of the reasons that paul is warning us here about our enemy the devil is that there are probably some of us even in this room who take him too lightly that we think, oh, well, this looks kind of like fun. This kind of looks interesting. This seems kind of edgy. And we we sort of flirt with these ideas and we buy into something and it may not be any problem right away. It may at first look like it's going great. It may take a full nine years. It may just take nine months. But you discover that Satan has put the squeeze on you. And there's some of us here this morning There's some of us right now who are living under the constraints and the bondage of the serpent. Now, the great news is that the serpent has been defeated. Satan is a defeated foe. That when Christ died on the cross, he basically betrayed Satan's plan. By shedding his blood on the cross, he, in a sense, broke the bondage of sin broke the squeeze, broke the constraints of our sin so that anybody who receives Jesus, not because we deserve it, but we actually receive the righteousness of God, that we are in a right relationship with him, not because our feet are always in the right place, but because we're facing the light of God's son. So the good news, the good news is that Satan is a defeated foe. The bad news is that there's some of us here this morning who are still flirting with this serpent who do not realize his schemes. And there are others of us who are here today who are constrained by by guilt, by accusations, by strategies of the enemy that want to suck the life out of you as a believer. That's why, that's why it always comes back to Jesus and his death on the cross because that's the victory. Be strong in Christ and in the strength of his might. I think that's, that's, that's essentially where Jesus was pointing that night. That, that's basically what he's trying to communicate indirectly to his disciples that night. When they gathered around the table, Jesus knew that it would only be hours before he himself would be on a cross and that he'd be crucified. Of course, those guys, they had no idea. They couldn't have possibly understood all of it any more than we really can understand all of it today. But he was trying to communicate to them, I have purchased for you freedom from the serpent. I have purchased from you freedom from bondage, freedom from sin. And it comes at the cost of my body. And that's why that night when they gathered around the table, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, broken for you. He said, take and eat this. And he said that, even knowing that there were some at the table who would betray him. Still, he invited them to eat. And then having said that, he took the cup. And in the same way, he said, this cup is a covenant of my blood. Again, the mystery, the wonder. They must have had so many questions, but he was reminding them in a sense that he was getting ready to offer his body as a perfect sacrifice so that it would no longer depend on their righteousness, but it would now become a new covenant 
his righteousness, a righteousness that we receive by faith from God's son. He said, take this cup and drink it. That night, they accepted that invitation around the table. And this morning, 2,000 years later, we are invited to the very same table. This morning, we're going to share together in this communion time, this Lord's Supper. There are a couple of very simple instructions that I want to give you. First of all, ushers will guide you to the front. You see several stations up here. When you get to the station, we're going to use what's called intinction, which means simply that you break off a piece of the bread and dip it into the cup, dip it into the cup. Thirdly, if you are, um, if you are a person who uh, wants gluten-free, to my right, we have a gluten-free table, so you can just go to that table over there. And then finally, um, if you want to stay here in the front and pray quietly, nobody's going to bother you. You can, you can just take some time to pray there um, after you've received the elements or before you receive the elements. Let me just say this, too. There's going to be a time here of quiet. Um, the music will be playing, but there won't be anybody talking. This will be a time for you to think about, think about the squeeze of the serpent, Maybe some of you this morning are being choked by despair, by worries about the start of school, by, by you know, worries about money, by sickness. The serpent, the serpent wants us to think he's in charge. This morning, maybe you want to say, Lord, remind me again. Remind me again of the great victory that I have in Christ. Buckle that belt tightly around me so I can hang all the stuff on it. Maybe this morning you want to use this time as a time of confession. Maybe you're going, you know, I've not been rightly using the gifts that you've given me, Lord. I know it. Maybe in a relationship. Maybe in your work. Maybe in the way you've used your mouth or your eyes. This is a time where you can say, Lord, I want to ask that you'll help me to put on the breastplate of your righteousness. So use this time as a time of communion. If you've never received Jesus and you've you, 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 you don't, you're not sure what it's all about, but you at least know this much that I know I have, been, I have been duped by the serpent. I've been duped by the enemy and I wanna know a new life in the armor of Christ. There's no better time than today to say, I wanna make that, good. I wanna make that decision. And uh, I'll be up here near the front and if you want me to pray with you to receive Jesus, uh, we, can, we can do that as well. So, um, Again, ushers will come. Let me just pray to consecrate the elements and then we'll together share in the Lord's Supper. Lord, thank you for the victory that's ours in Christ. We can't win it on our own. We can huff and puff, but we're not gonna blow it, anything down. It's gonna only be a victory that comes by your hand. You invite us this morning to be strong in you in the strength of your might. We live in a culture that calls us to be strong in our own might, in our own gifts, in our portfolio, in our good looks, our good grades, our academic ability, whatever it is. But Lord, you are our protection against a very real enemy. This is not a play fight. So this morning as we receive this bread and this cup, we pray that you would in your miraculous way by your spirit, that you would somehow as we receive these elements, that we would receive you in a renewed, refreshing, and mighty way. Lord, that you're just divine alchemy. We don't know how it would work, but we pray that we might, even in this time of communion, receive a fresh measure of your grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen.